going to get easier. I think that's right. And one of the things in the, there's, I mean, a lot going on now where I don't know what the right thing to do is. I mean, on a policy level, I'm trying to work it out, but um, it's hard to know. And, and we could talk about the role of philosophy in, in all of this and trying to understand these things. But there's also, there's going to be a period after the, this crisis has passed and everybody is going to be rethinking um, everything. And um, who's to blame? What's to blame? What kind of society should we have? Why did this happen? What would have prevented it? And there's going to be, that's going to be a time to really push. And we need to be working now to understand these issues. And we need to be in a position to um, advocate for um, what's right, not on concrete issues like what should you do once you have something that's spreading rapidly through your population, but how, you know, what could we have done not to be in this kind of situation and to yep. be more prepared and so forth. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem is that the, the mixed economy and, and the mixed premises people have have put us in a position where there is no good, there are no good answers. There is no way to deal with problems without violating rights, for example, because rights have been violated for decades in, in, in setting ourselves up for, for where we are today. So um, feel free, guys, to ask uh, if you want to ask questions. There's a super chat. Uh, we've got we've got our first question, which relates to this. So I might as well jump into it. What are both of your opinions on the infringements of our rights due to the shutdown? Even in a pandemic, do you think our rights should be preserved? Yeah, I mean, rights should be preserved always. But there's a question about what it looks like to preserve them in, in different situations. And I think in emergency situations, there are certainly places where governments can issue shelter in place orders or things like that for short times. I find it hard to justify the kind of length and extent of it that's happening now. Um, but there's another aspect to this. And this is why I say I don't really have worked out how to deal with this. Um, people, liberty and rights are, it's not like in a state of nature we're free and secure. And then, you know, governments might come and interfere with our rights or criminals might come and interfere with our rights. If you imagine like, primitive people living in a tribe or people living in a really early civilization. They're living on top of each other. Their whole life is public and controlled by the group. And part of what the evolution of good government over the centuries has been and the development of individualism and the principle of rights is figuring out how when people are living together and close and on top of each other and everything they do impacts one another, how can we make it so that each person is able to lead his own life by his own judgment. And he can make choices and incur risks and so forth. And then he suffers the consequences if those risks go badly and gets the rewards if they go well. And um, even like the, the advent of private property, someone had to come up with, you know, you can own land. And then what you do to the land, you get to keep when you improve it. And you could have property and other things and so forth. Um, one fact about human beings is that we can get sick and we can spread disease to one another. And that when we live close to one another, we can be vectors for spreading disease to one another. And uh, when we didn't understand well how that worked, there was nothing we could do about it. Now that we do understand better how it works, uh, we have to think about, well, how, I have to think more than I have about how should law handle this? How do we define rights in this context? And it's a very bad result in a crisis when everybody um, forget what the law should do. When there's a problem where if you know we go out of our houses, we might uh, cause a disease to avalanche out of control and kill more people. Um, we're in a situation where it seems like our abilities to live with one another conflict. That my doing something will come at someone else's expense and someone else's doing it will come at my expense and who's gonna sacrifice by who's staying in. Um, part of what we need to understand better is how over the long run to separate our lives, to disentangle our lives, to define the principles that we each have a sphere in which we can act. And my doing what I do will not endanger Iran or someone's grandmother or someone else somewhere. And uh, part of that might be thinking about like what kind of liability can individuals have for their own spreading of disease? What um, uh, And different ways to 
monetize that relate it to um, what kind of insurance and healthcare you have. And there's a lot of thinking about how, uh, how to make it, do we each have the maximum amount of control over our own life and our own risk, given the fact that diseases like this are possible? Yeah, and it's, it, it's complicated because there are all kinds of diseases and, um, you know, you can't sue somebody for giving you the cold, I don't think. Right. Um, and where, where do you cross the line? And, what, and, and this is, I, I never thought of it quite this way, but it's true that if you had a, actually, if you had an actual insurance market in these kind of things, the market would determine what's the threshold by which in a sense you're self-insured getting a cold, no big deal. I lose a couple of days of work or oh, where it gets to the point where, no, no, I really need insurance for this. So, and, and markets would probably, or, or governments would develop kind of markets for what constitutes real threats, what constitutes insurable threats, what is non-insurable. Um, but, but we live in a world where none of this is thought out. None of this is where the president can announce uh, a state of emergency out of nowhere, or state governors can announce a state of an emergency. You don't need to legislate. I mean, another thing is, I mean, if this is like a war, then shouldn't Congress declare war? Shouldn't this be legislated? Shouldn't Congress have declared a state of emergency with regard to coronavirus and given the president some special powers in that context rather than, in a sense, the executive just grabbing those powers? Because even a war today, we don't declare war. The president just does what he wants. So we live in such a distorted time in terms of even our constitutional mm -hmm. protections, even, even the way the founders thought of separation of powers and and. It, it, it's so hard to think about what could be in a, in a, in a proper government. Including that, that it, proper governments need to evolve, not in their basic principles, but in how they actually function to deal with new knowledge of what's possible, new levels of technology. And so if you think about how would you, the, the principle of rights and the, the structure of a proper government is meant to make it possible for you to have maximum control over your own life and separate it out distinct from other people's lives. You have a sphere in which you are sovereign. So given that um, other people can infect you with things and you can infect people with other things if you come too close to them, how do we deal with that? And how do we deal with the range of risk that there is? Well, first of all, I mean, in a proper government, all property would be privately owned. So there wouldn't be public spaces where you're interacting with people. All right, so then presumably different property owners would have different policies about when they would mandate social distancing on their property and when they wouldn't. And maybe there could be, um, maybe the government could determine that certain practices would be reckless endangerment um, or uh, there would be default things about what you would and wouldn't allow that you would have to sign a waiver to, you know, yeah, you can go over this guy's house or shop in this guy's mall, but understand that it's a, um, he's operating it in a different fashion than other people operated in. And it's therefore contagion is more possible there than in other places. And then uh, you might have to have different kinds of insurance to, you know, if you're doing that, there's all kinds of ways that market forces can solve this. But what it means for market forces to solve it is individuals are free to come up with ways to solve it if we define the rights properly in the first place that gives them the control over their own rights and interactions. And this is, you know, I don't know exactly what that way to set them is and what the way to define them is, but that's the kind of thinking that I think has to go into understanding uh, how a government should function ideally and then um, what small changes to our present government would get us you know, more and more in that direction. And of course, you know, in such a, in just a society, people would bear the cost of their own mistakes. People would bear the cost of their own decisions. You wouldn't have socialized the cost of medicine. So if you got sick, you would have to pay for that. And, and the insurance, your insurance company would have an incentive to motivate you to behave in appropriate ways. So for example, there could be a clause in your insurance policy that says when there's, when the government announces there's a pandemic, so it would still depend on some announcement. Then we expect you to behave this way. Otherwise, you're not covered. And if you get sick, we're not going to pay for you. So there's so many ways to incentivize people and to, and to create the right kind of contractual voluntary relationships between people when people are free to make those kind of choices. Yeah, there's a kind of caricature of individualism where people imagine it's based on this idea that every person 
is sort of an isolated, like windowless monad in Leibniz's system, like somehow totally distinct from and not impacted by everybody else. And every piece of property is sort of totally distinct from every other one floating in a void. And then, well, individualism isn't true because what you do with your property affects mine. And if you pollute something, it might drift over into mine. And if I cough, maybe it gets on you. But the whole principle of individualism is, of course, we're not these atoms in void floating apart from one another. We are human beings living in a world in which matter is continuous and everything's touching and things get and everything affects everything else. And what we do is in light of that, we figure out how to draw the lines to separate things out such that one person's mind can control his life. And he's able to live his life by his own reasoning and the next person over is and the next person over it. And as much of their interaction as possible is chosen by them. And the more that we understand the ways in which we can impact one another, like by as vectors for disease to spread or in some other way, the more we can understand how to uh, create the laws and define the rights such as to empower people to live that way. So it's real individualism starts with the recognition that we're not automatically separated out from one another. We're all thrown into one another and we have to figure out if we each value our own lives and recognize that our own mind and own choice and own decision making is what makes our life possible to us and worth living, figure out how to give us each a sphere in which we're sovereign and keep those spheres separate so that we know what's up to whom. And, and it, once you have that, then you have markets and capitalism and it can solve these problems. Yeah. And, and the, the orientation here is very different than the orientation that libertarians have because the orientation here is towards the positive. It's towards the creating a sphere in which you can positively impact your life and pursue your values and use your mind. I mean, when libertarians often talk about rights, when they talk about rights, they talk about it as, you know, my rights end with, you know, when my fist approaches your nose or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's all a negative. It's all in the sense of rights, uh, uh, you know, as long as I don't hurt you, I can do whatever the hell I want. That That's the kind of perspective on rights, which is completely wrong in terms of, you know, it's so much more about empowering the positive and positive in the sense of the right way of living. Yeah, I mean, it's it's negative in the sense that it's about em empowering the positive by separating it out from the things other people can do that can make it impossible, that can harm you. So there's a sense in which, you know, my freedom ends where your nose begins or whatever is, is true. And what they call negative rights, I don't have a right to something from you. I have a right to freedom from you. But then why do I have a right to freedom from you? How do we understand what freedom is? And it's not some default state that we find What's ourselves. What's the value of freedom? Why should, I be, why should I value freedom? Exactly. And it's not some default thing that people automatically value or automatically know what it is or automatically exist. Another way I think of it with libertarianism is there's this kind of ridiculous thing that libertarians claim, like every government goes bad or gets worse. As though governments, there was some garden of Eden where everybody, nobody forced anybody. And then somebody, the first guy robbed someone and someone had the idea, well, we'll set up a government to stop a robber again. And for a couple of days it went well, but then suddenly the Gestapo came or something. Um, but that is totally a historical. Most governments haven't gotten worse over time. It's not like we started in some kind of free state and it became more and more totalitarian. Uh, by and large, governments have gotten better. Um, I mean, if you look, Mike, if you look at America's government over certain periods, it's gotten worse or other governments. But it's not like every time society's improved and people have become more free. It's because there's been a bloody revolution and we started from scratch. There's been evolution to more and more respect for, not enough, I mean, but still over a period of time, more and more respect for freedom, for individualism. If you think about Britain from the Middle Ages until the, into the 19th century, I mean, this is, um, you know, there were some revolutions occasionally along the way, but it was mostly a free development, mostly a bloodless development towards the better. And, um, it's because it's not, freedom is not something automatic. It's not a default state. It's an achievement. Rand spoke about government as having the purpose of extracting force from social relations. And that's something we have to learn to do and come up with institutions to do. And the right institution is a capitalist, a government that's based on the protection of individual rights. But that's a real achievement. And it's not an achievement that's been fully made. We've approached it, but not gotten there.
So I, I do want to return to the question because I'm not sure we completely answered it. So what is my opinion on the infringement of our rights? I mean, I do think our rights are being infringed today. They're being infringed partially because the arbitrary nature of what's being done, uh, partially because there's no timeline, there's no, there's no plan, there's no strategy. There's, you get a sense of people just acting, some second-handedly, the, the governors and mayors who are saying, well, why am I doing the shutdown? Well, because everybody else has done it, so it, it sounds like the right idea. Um, to Como saying the other day, well, maybe it was wrong of me to actually shut down the entire economy. Who knows? You know, kind of as if, you know, the, nobody had thought this through. Nobody had a plan. Or, so I do think their rights being infringed primarily because of this uh, irrational, almost, um, uh, you know, emotionalistic response to the, to the crisis. And also because of the, of the failure to deal with it appropriately early on. Now, maybe we would have got to this point anyway, even if the government had done the best that it could have done with the testing and the data early on. But we don't know that because they screwed it up so badly. So it's, um, you know, here in Puerto Rico, this, in, in, in context, this dropped, right? So you can't even take a walk here. You can't even go out of your, I mean, it's absurd. So if you believe in social distancing, then okay. If, as long as you're far away from people, then that should be fine. But uh, here, you, you they don't even want to... I mean, you can't literally be alone in a park because the park is, quote, closed. And this goes to to the fact that there's no private property, which... which but even if there is, right? Even if I owned the park, they'd still close it. They wouldn't let me hang out. Yeah, there's a... You have to think about where the rights violations are and when they took place. So, in effect, the way the healthcare system is run and the way lots of things are run are such that we've been shackled together years ago. Yep. And so now we're kind of all in this together in a way we didn't have to be. And then on top of the, the, the really egregious ways in which we've been shackled together where we didn't used to be, that is we have so, our medicine is so much more socialized everywhere in the world than it, it once was. Um, there's also ways in which we've just failed to figure out how to um, deal governmentally with the situation of infectious disease. So we are by default thrown all in the same boat when better crafting of laws, better figuring out how to define rights in, in this domain would have gotten us out of this boat. That is, it's an achievement to have a good government. Right? Um, so we're all kind of thrust in with one another in ways that we could have avoided based on things we already know and could have learned to avoid uh, in the things we don't know. And so we're in a situation where we're unfortunately in a lifeboat and in an emergency. And so some kind of restrictions, I think, are unavoidable. And they are violations of rights, but they're violations of rights that were baked in from the beginning. Um, that said, I don't think, I think there's additional violations in how this is being handled. So I don't know how much locking in for how long can possibly be justified, but I know that none of it can be justified without clear plans, honesty about what's happening, honesty about how we got here, uh, honesty about, you know, transparency about what's going on, that this is a horrible, abnormal situation. You're being asked to do something that would normally, you couldn't be asked to be done. And we owe you, whoever governor or government that's doing it, a plan. Um, we have no right to um, any kind of petty personal squabbling, um, any kind of offense, uh, they should be, you know, profusely apologizing for this having to be the situation and saying, we'll tell you everything as soon as we know what we're going to, and, and really be doing this with a plan for how to get out of it. And it's clear that our leaders are panicked and they're not doing that. And, um, and, and so, and there's, this, and there's also this weird, they're not willing to actually say that some people are more susceptible than others, right? So we all know it, but they, I've seen nobody on the stage say, you know, and if you're over 65 or if you have pre-existing conditions, you should be a thousand times more careful because you, you know, you're likely to, the probability of you dying is actually significantly higher. It's as if their egalitarianism doesn't allow them to differentiate between those who are susceptible, we all must suffer equally in some way in, in, the, in these lock lockdowns. There's, 
when people are giving personal advice on it, they do make that distinction, right? Be particularly careful if you're immunocompromised or this or that. But when our policy prescriptions have been um, uh, too blind to it, and I do think there's a kind of egalitarianism behind that, and also a kind of faking of reality at, at a broad level. I mean, I think the earliest policy responses to this were, let's try to do this little thing Whatever little thing is consistent with what we already thought, uh, what kind of thing we already like to do, and hope it'll fix things. So yeah. for Trump, it was shut down some borders, right? Because uh, he always likes shutting down borders. That's his go-to thing. And then maybe that'll fix it, and I won't have to think about it anymore. Uh, but for other politicians who have different views and different things, and maybe, you know, whatever you think about borders, maybe you think they should be shut down. I think they shouldn't in general. But... You know, if it was someone who had my policy, it might be loosen this regulation or this one thing. But one little thing that we imagine will fix it and then we don't have to think about it. And uh, when it got worse, it's now we know, you know, we have to do this lockdown. But there's a kind of, I think, happy talk, evasive thinking that when each measure is taken, this will be the one that will solve the problem. Yep. And not grappling with the fact that the problem is not fully solvable at this point. There's going to be a lot of death and a lot of destruction. Mistakes have been made. There can't be getting out of that. And then the question is, how do we minimize the damage? And really thinking integratively about all the levels of damage and all the different types of damage. And you can't think you're going to save every life at infinite cost to the economy as though uh, damaging the economy and locking people in their homes, basically imprisoning them, is not damaging their lives, both in the sense of the quality of life, what makes life worth living, and second, literally, people will die because of it, or they'll live their last year's year in a you know in a cage, um, which is not a way that's worth living. So, um, there's going to have to be a real reckoning with you know this measure would save some lives, although still a lot of people will die. This measure would save some more lives. But it's the difference is not worth it, and uh, and people can't be demanded to make that sacrifice to save other people's lives. And part of it is going to have to be recognizing that some people are more vulnerable, and they're going to have to uh, just in the nature of reality go through higher, go through more to protect themselves. And we should try to help them, but um, we can't try to create a world in which the most susceptible to this are, are the most susceptible to the worst effects are prevented at all costs from dying, even if everybody else is made to suffer indefinitely. Yeah, we, we remember we Como, to, Como at some point implied that, basically. He said, one yeah. life, one life. And, and that's... Uh, okay, let's, let's do... What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, Many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...